Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Romans 6. We'll read from verse 12, even though we'll be focusing really from verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Romans and chapter 6. Romans 6. Those of you who are able, let me ask you to rise to your feet, even as we read this passage together. Romans 6, and I'll read from verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. As we come to the end of chapter 6, my ambition, my hope with this very message is that the Lord would use it to make it clear for us that there are only two options that exist for all of us. Either for our lives to be wholly, entirely owned, defined, driven by God, or for our lives to be owned driven, controlled by sin. I pray that the Lord would use this text to allow all of us as saints to advance in our sanctification and that those who might be present who are not believers, that the Lord would use these very truths to draw you to himself, that whatever lies or deceit that once upon a time held myself, and many in this very room would be exposed and broken this very day and that the Lord would lead you to himself. I pray that the result of this would be a community, a congregation that would advance in holiness and in love. That we together in the sight of God would be washed and would be renewed. That we would look more like Christ who is our King. That if he, if he were to return at the end of the week or at the end of the year, he would look back and say, I used this very word to prepare you for that very day. That our lives would be filled, and that's the word right there, filled with every fruit of righteousness on that particular day. There's a couple of points that uh, I want us to um, derive from this section. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, 
Um, one of them is that we were slaves. We were slaves. The second one is that we were saved. And though we were slaves to sin, the Lord in his mercy saved us. The second portion of this particular text, the first one is those two. The second one of this portion is that we have been called to be sanctified. The newness of life that the believer has been offered is defined with this imperative, be sanctified. And the eternal life that we all long for is defined by that word, we shall be glorified. The last portion that we were looking at together in Romans chapter 6, wrapped up like this in verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Paul in this section has been seeking to answer the question that he raised at the very beginning. After articulating almost overly, um, eloquently in chapter 5, the heights of grace, the unthinkable, scandalous heights of grace that the Lord extends to us, the question that emerges is what then? Shall we continue to sin that grace might abound? Because in chapter 5 he said basically, here's how secure we are in Christ. Here's how secure we are in Christ. That where sin abounds, grace does what? Superabounds. It's like impossible in the life of a saint for him to not be saved. If he is in Christ, he is secure. That's why he hopes. Because his salvation is entirely based on Christ. Hey, it sounds like a ticket, doesn't it? Sounds like a license to go out then and sin. And so chapter 6. No. Shall we continue to sin so that grace might abound? Uses the strongest words possible. No. Not ever. Here's what chapter 6 is about. Chapter 6 is basically about why it is impossible for a Christian to continue in sin. That's basically what chapter 6 is about. Chapter 5, it is impossible for anybody who is in Christ Jesus to be lost. It's impossible. Why? Because his salvation is entirely a work that is dependent on who? Jesus. Chapter 6, it is impossible for us who have been saved, us wretches like us, who have been saved by grace alone, through Christ alone, in faith alone, to continue to walk in sin. That's what chapter 5 is about. Why? Why is that impossible? Well, multiple things. So it wraps up in chapter 5 and verse 11, isn't it? Or verse 14, rather, for, for sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under the law but under grace. Articulating basically that the reason we have confidence that we shall live differently in light of our sin than we did before we became Christians is because it's not the law that is our primary, it's not the, the, the primary way we relate to our God anymore. In chapter 5, he told us that what the law does is it increases sin. The ideas of you do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, very much like it does with a child. You shall not do this, you shall not do this, you shall not do this. Giving that law in its very self aggravates the flesh and causes, almost leads to an increase of sin. Right? But that's not how the believer lives now. He does not relate to God through the law. He relates to God through grace. And when grace reigns, the believer knows ability to turn away from sin that the law never gave, that the law never gave. The law is not bad. It's just powerless. Grace is where the power is. This is why it's impossible for the one who is under the law, under, under grace and not under the law, to continue in sin. In verse 15, he restates the same problem again. Resist the same problem. 
What then are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? He repeats it again, by no means. It's a question he starts off in verse 1 with and he repeats it again in verse 15. Why is it impossible for us to sin? That's because of the change that has happened. Paul, first of all, begins by explaining to us the reality that there are only two choices on the shelf. There are only two masters. It is impossible for us. There is no neutral ground that exists for the believer. In verse 16, he asks a question. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness. If we understand that there are only two possible states that exist, we understand that it is impossible for one to have been transferred from one state to the other and continue to live in sin. That's what Paul is basically arguing. This is a hard thing for us this morning to swallow because I highly suspect that for those of us who have come as unbelievers this very morning, you do not see yourself as a slave. You might perhaps even see Christianity and it being offered to you as an invitation to slavery. Right now you're free, and you love your freedom. And Christianity looks like bondage to you. Well, that's not the reality that is being articulated here. You're being told that whatever you obey, you are a slave to that thing that you obey, whatever it is that you obey. There is no possibility that any of us lives in neutrality. It's not possible. There's a man called Kaisman who says this, one is never free from a master. And those non-Christians, or in this case, in Romans, Christians who think that they are free are under an illusion created and sustained by Satan. The choice with which people are faced is not should I retain my freedom or should I give it up and submit to God? But rather, the choice is, should I serve sin or should I serve God? Should I serve sin or should I serve God? Verse 17 articulates then for us clearly. Here's the two choices on the shelf. Slavery to sin or slavery to God. And Paul is asking the question, do you not know? Do you not know how critical the role of obedience is in your life? Obedience is a big deal. Obedience reveals whom you serve, whom you answer to. Here's a way to think about it. There is no minute, hour, day of your life when you are not answering to one of two masters. None. Are we clear on this? This is what this verse is saying. There are no neutral moments in your life. You are either serving God or you are serving sin. And the state that we were in before we met Christ is described as a state of slavery to sin. Those first words in verse 16 are very important. Do you not know? When Paul uses those words, it's really an indictment to the church. Because the church many times can end up coming up with its own theology, eh? A kind of nice theology that kind of gleans the Bible, takes the nice stuff, eh? Takes the nice stuff. Everything is nice, brother. Just don't say, like, can you say the other stuff is not nice? Takes the nice stuff and creates like a cozy Christianity for itself. And what Paul is saying is, you ought to know this, O oh, saints. But you don't, clearly. Do you not know that there is no neutrality in your 
life. This idea of presenting oneself is kind of availing yourself. Uh, availing your time, heart, mind, money, gifts, ambition. Availing that which you are and that which you have. At the, making it, putting it at, at the disposal of something or someone. And what Paul is saying is the one to whom you have put yourself, your time, your gifts, your money, your fill in the blank, at the disposal of, you're that person's slave. You're that person's slave. You're either serving the flesh or the spirit. You'll see this dual nature all over. Galatians kind of speaks about it like that, chapter 5, doesn't it? See no righteousness, Satan, or God. This all begins in the garden, right? Begins in the garden. Adam and Eve, you remember this story, right? They are slaves to God. You can call it that. They are under the authority of God. They have been given a command, and they're supposed to obey that command. Eat of every other tree, but of this tree, knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. It's a command. And what are they doing? In light of that command, they are, what's the word? Obeying that command. They are obeying God. Satan waltz in. This is slavery. What am I offering you? Freedom. I am offering to you freedom. Freedom from this slavery that God has called you to. Heed me, and you will be free. It's, 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 it's the lie that he still kind of just recycles, revanishes, repaints, reclothes, and offers it again to your hearts, maybe even today. To lean, to submit yourself to God, bad. Come and experience freedom. Come and experience freedom. Ephesians chapter 2 will speak about the fact that the freedom he offered to us was really slavery. Because that verse speaks about nothing but following. Following the three things that he articulates there. Just turn there. It's not too far away from you. Ephesians chapter 2. Read with me from verse 1. The state he describes here is that you are dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. Well, how, how does somebody who's dead look like? Don't think that they are inanimate, huh? that they are docile and inactive. That's not the biblical understanding of dead in trespasses and sins. Super active, guys. What's going on with them? With us too, they are walking. It's like the walking dead, right? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. That's slavery. This is who you are. If you're not following God, who are you following? The prince of the power of darkness, of this world. The sons of disobedience. You're following the passions of your flesh. You're following. Someone else is calling and dictating, and you are serving that thing, that person, that end. Salvation in First Thessalonians is described as uh, turning away from idols to worship God. Just listen to this portion here in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Don't turn there, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. Instructions for Timothy and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Listen to what he says then. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I bet you that's not what the individual is thinking about themselves, as they are rejecting the gospel, as they are refuting the claims of Jesus that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. They're thinking that Christianity thing. I don't agree with it because of this and because of that and because of this. Second Corinthians 4 speaks about it the same way. There are no neutral positions. You have either been captured by God, or you've been captured by the enemy. You're either a slave of God, or you are a slave of sin. 
a legal definition of slavery is slavery law. Sorry, slavery is a a slave is a person owned by someone, and slavery is the state of being under the control of someone, where a person is forced to work for another. A slave is considered as a property of another, as the one controlling them purchases them or owns them from their birth. This is a culture that Paul is writing in where there's slavery all around them. It it doesn't look like modern day slavery in many ways, but nonetheless the ideas of someone being owned by another and someone being controlled by another are very visible all around them. And what Paul is saying to them is, listen, you are either owned by and controlled by one of these two things. There are no neutral grounds. Tim Keller has a very useful analogy here of of helping us understand the kind of slavery that God is calling us to. Modern people like to see freedom as the complete absence of any constraints. But think of a fish. Because a fish absorbs oxygen from water and not air, it is free only if it is restricted to water. If a fish is freed from the river, and, puts, and, and is put on the grass to explore, its freedom to move and soon even to live is destroyed. The fish is not more free, but less free. It cannot honor the reality of its nature. The same is true of airplanes and birds. If they violate the laws of aerodynamics, they will crash into the ground. But if they follow them, they will ascend and soar. The same is true in many areas of life. Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, those that fit with the realities of our own nature and those of the world. And he writes this in his book, The Good Endeavor, Every Good Endeavor. There's nothing like not being under the control of any. So let me ask you a question then. Whose slave are you? Whose slave are you? What portion of your life, O believer, do you view as not being under God, but it's okay? But it's okay. This is my life. This is my life. And I have given God this. Amen? A lot. A lot. God is big and amazing, so let me give him a lot. Like like all of, you know, one and a half hours on Sunday morning. Right? and 10% of my income, and devotions every now and then, and fill in the blank. But the rest of your life, who owns it? Who controls it, I ask? There's only two choices. Let me ask you, as Paul did, do you not know? Do you not know? that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey. So that if you are seeking to serve the Lord, grow in sanctification, and the way in which you are growing in sanctification is, I, will, I want to grow, Lord, in this area of my life. Right here is where the problem is. Don't, don't like sanctify me too much. I don't want to become like, like a super Christian or anything like that. I just want to get rid of this very nasty sin because it's really interfering with my comfort and enjoyment of life right now. Amen to this kind of life? Do you not know? It doesn't work like that. There's only how many choices? Two. Have you believed the lie created by the enemy himself? We saw where he created it. All the way back there in Genesis. Doesn't reveal all the information, does he? Have you believed that lie? Are you even today, right where you sit, convinced that it is possible to actually give only a portion of your life to God and keep the self to keep the rest to yourself? That's not how the Bible articulates the truths about who you are. 
If you have believed that lie, there's no way you make progress in sanctification. The Bible way. There's no way. There's no coming to God with a list that says, I have a couple of things I need your help with. Who's controlling this conversation? It's me. I, I'm the one who, who, who's handling this conversation. It's really my life, and I really like my life to be like this. I have, a, I have an idea, Lord, about my life. I'd want it to be holy enough and moral enough, but also a lot of fun, amen? I like fun. Ken likes fun, especially in the house. Ask my wife, right? Ish. <laughs> Salvation is described instead as God taking all of you, purchasing you, buying you, making you his own. Look at that next verse. That's basically what Paul says to them. We were slaves, but we have been saved. We have been saved. I like how it says it in verse 17. This is very important. Because, you know, we didn't forget grace in chapter 5. This is, how, this is how grace looks like in the life of a believer. If you are a Christian, this is what happened to you. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That's the description of conversion. A very interesting description of conversion, isn't it? Paul uses to articulate what happened to you when you encountered Christ, not only with words about faith, but quite importantly with the word of obedience. Here's what happened to you if you're a Christian. The way in which we found out that you've become a Christian is you obeyed. You obeyed the gospel. Like this is, listen, let, let, let me pause again because I just know how the law, our legalist heart, like just, it's never too far away, huh? You are being, if you are a Christian, God's work in you led you to do this. Led you to do this. If, 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 it's, a, if it's a delivery room, your first act of bowing the knee and saying of Christ, you're not only my savior, but my what? But my Lord, you are God. I turn away from my sin. I place my faith in you. That very act was the very first evidence this world had of, of life. It's like that cry of the baby who has just been born. That's alive. Why? Because they obeyed. Now salvation, in its very basic essence, it's quite interesting, the words he uses here, speaks about us being committed to, or, or other versions might say, being handed over Two. And that Caphrasia speaks about a transfer of realms. You were a slave to sin, but how did you become Christians? You obeyed something different. Your whole life you lived at the beck and call of the passions of your flesh, of this fallen world, and of Satan. That's all you've ever known. Yes, even when you did good stuff, right? Even when you did good stuff, like give handouts or sing in a Christmas choir, right, or, or, or any good things, help somebody out, give your money for something good, it was never because of who? God. I love God. I fear God. I'm submitted to God. My life belongs to him. As an unbeliever, we can do good things, but not for the ultimate good reason, which is God himself. And that day you became a Christian was the very first day because of being informed by the truth about God, you obeyed him, and you turned from your sin, and you bent the knee, and that was a signifying thing that you had transferred realms, you see. He just said yes to a God whom he has never related to before. Yes about I'm a sinner. I am a wretch. I don't have a small problem. I am totally undeserving of any good thing from you. He said yes to the definition of the only way of salvation. It is Christ alone. And you turned to him, bent the knee, and you believed in him. Paul calls that what in this, in this book? Obedience of faith, doesn't he? Obedience of faith. There's no space between James and Paul, you see. None at all. James will emphasize the, the faith that saves is a faith that works. It's alive. It does stuff. 
Paul is saying the faith that saves is a faith that is defined in essence by obedience, you see. From the very first day that you became a Christian. It's quite interesting that typically in 2 Timothy especially, I think Paul speaks to Timothy in terms of the, the truth that has been handed over to you. The gospel committed to you. But here, what does he say? We are the ones who have been committed to a certain pattern of truth. It's very interesting. Those who are Christians, not only are they known by the fact that on that very first day they bent their knee and they said, you are Lord and you are God. Right? But what the, the, the change, the transfer here is that now they come underneath this. They come underneath this, good people. God rules through his word. And when they became Christians, this, they changed their relationship with this entirely. This became the very word of who? The very word of God. He speaks, we do. I mean, I've shared my testimony like 75,000 times at this pulpit, right? But that's what I never got, guys. I never got that. How did I become a Christian? How did I become a Christian? After singing in the choir for four years and hanging out with the pastor almost every Sunday for lunch. How did I become a Christian after all of that? Like, I was so deceived. I was like a kid in class, like, always hand up, oh, this one is a very good teenager. This one really knows it. I just realized, you know what? I live for who? Me. What God says, I really don't care about it. Like, like never once in my life am I ever like, well, you know what? God, God won't be pleased with that. My flesh wants it. My bodies would think it's epic and amazing. I would become really famous in school if I did this. But I'm a Christian, and I, I answer to another God. Never did that happen once. If my flesh wanted it, I took it. There was no restraints whatsoever. I did what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. When I, I was king of my life, I was slave to my sin. And then the Lord showed me, mm -mm. I'm not your savior. I'm your judge. And if you're to stand before me today, there's nothing in your life that would ever show any evidence of, look at what you're doing right now. It's for me, because of me. This is how I became a Christian. And the teaching is not just any teaching, it's the gospel. It's the rule of teaching. It's the pattern of teaching that's been handed over to them. This is how we became believers. And so the instruction is this. If you understand that what God has done for you, in you, through you, is that you were once a slave to sin, where you answered to its every beck and call, whether it's your flesh or the enemy through temptation or the world itself, and that when you were converted, you got a new master. That's what happened to you. He's not asking them to do this. Are you seeing that? He's telling them it was done. This was the effect of grace upon your life. You became obedient to God. That's what happened for you. All of you are saints. If that's what happened to you then, hit this, be sanctified. You have already been given a new master, a new king, a new God. So how do you live your life? You don't live your life now as one who answers to God, is a slave of God, has been purchased by God, owned by God, a fish that was saved from the beach and was restored back again to the water. You don't now live your life as a fish that has been saved by spending as much time as you possibly can on the beach and then when you're just about to die, Take a sip of water again. Why would you live like that? That's not the life of a saint. The call instead is be sanctified. Verse 19 to 22. Verse 19 to 22. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. I really like that line. Like Paul is just really flattering them, isn't he? You have natural limitations, guys. I have to use illustrations to help you, like fish on the beach and things like this. 
This is Paul with all of us as readers of the book of Romans. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and you have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. Two choices, good people. Are you seeing them? Two choices and the consequences are grand, staggering, life-changing, heaven and hell, life and death, sin and righteousness. If you believe the lie, that you can double with submitting yourself to sin, submitting yourself to self, and come out with something good, like life, you've fallen into the trap. You should know better, Christians. The choices could not be more different. On the one hand, you have glory, and on the other hand, you have death. And Paul is bringing this all the way in to your day-to-day -day life. To your day-to-day -day life. So it gives them an imperative here. This is an instruction. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. That's what Christians do. You've been saved. Now you're in the water. Swim. Swim. Do backflips, descend to the bottom of the ocean, explore all of the beauty of this newness of life that the Lord has afforded you. And what does that look like? Obedience to God. Obedience to God, that's what it looks like. When you speak about the believer and, and, and the freedom that the believer has, the believer is not termed as free to basically do whatever he wants to do. You'll see that in Galatians chapter 5 as well. That's not the definition of a, of a believer. Licentiousness. Wickedness. And then I say, ah, all of this is grace. Rather, the believer has been set free to be able to obey God willingly. Willingly. Think about that. Joyfully. Happily. That's the freedom. That's how you know this one has experienced grace. Why? Because the power of grace in his life has set him free from slavery to sin. And now look at him. He is happily obeying God. And that's what you celebrate. Grace of the other kind kills, eh? Because that's not the grace of God. That's the hyper-grace stuff, the, 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 the aspects of grace that basically lead to sin and iniquity and say it is totally all right. Pastor Jeremy, I think, preached in Second Peter and chapter 3, and that's exactly, chapter 2, that's how the false teachers were described, isn't it? False teachers were described basically by saying when you look at their lives, you see no evidence of this that we're talking about. Instead, they are promoting sin and even leading entire congregations to sin and saying that's not what the Bible calls us to. So present your members to God. This idea of present is used five times in these few verses. It's a very key idea to grasp. If you go through this and you don't get, there's two choices on the shelf, you miss the grace portion for you today. If you go through this and you don't get this idea of availing yourself, to put yourself at God's disposal is the point here. That's sanctification. You miss the heart of this particular passage. It's an imperative. Here's what you say as fish in the water now. Lord, I give you my mind, my heart, my eyes, my, my strength, my passions, my talent, my time. Give him everything. These things, O oh Lord, I have employed to myself, to serve myself, to serve my passions, my ambitions, my, my, my. And Lord, the end of that has not been life or anything good. 
those who serve other gods, their lives are filled with sorrow. When you make your life about you, you have distorted an exceedingly critical part of why God made you. God made you for himself. Listen, any portions of your life that you keep to yourself are the portions that there's going to be decay to submit and surrender yourself to God for his purposes according to his already revealed will and asking him to continue to guide and to lead. That's where life flourishes. Go to Luke chapter 9. Just so we don't think this is kind of a narrow description here in, in the book of Romans. Luke 9 Christ is speaking about salvation. We read from verse 23. Here's what he says. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you, truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. How does Christ describe following him? Take up your cross and follow me. He's saying this, Ken. Ken, Ken, listen to me. You trying to save your life, keep it to yourself, be God over it, to control it, to use your mind the way you think it ought to be used, use your time, the purposes that you aim for, if you kind of claim those and say, Lord, I have plans for those. I am not yielding those over to you. He says, Ken, that's where you start dying. That's where sorrow, emptiness, everything. Death lives there, Ken. Do you know what life is? To die to yourself. So counterintuitive. To die to yourself and say, Lord, I want to be your slave. I won't justify thoughts that I know are wrong in my mind. I'm going to fight them. I'm going to submit those to you. That means thoughts of self-pity, lust, anger, bitterness, slander, everything. Even those that feel nice, you can wallow in them. As though you're the focus of the universe. Everyone hates me. Everyone's scheming against me. Well, that doesn't sound true. That doesn't sound like it's of you. I'm going to take that thought and submit it to your feet. Lord, I want to think of you. I want to set my mind on things above, on the things of the spirit, things true, good, noble, praiseworthy, things that have virtue. Lord, I want to think about those things. I want to meditate on your wondrous works, ponder on your character. Lord, here's my mind. I'm yielding it over to you. I'm fish that's now exploring this world of doing what God tells me, not doing what sin tells me. Because there's no neutrality, you see. There's no neutrality. Because when I'm thinking thoughts that are not in line with what God has told me, I should not expect life out of it. I should expect things to decay and start smelling pretty soon. And you'll sense it in my character and my attitude, isn't it? My gracelessness, my inability to be patient or forgive in any way to anyone. Why? Because you know what? All week long, who has been ruling my mind? You try to speak right things and think wrong ones. Ever tried that? I have. It doesn't work. Here's my mind. Here's my tongue. Lord, I want to speak that which is profitable, that which is true. Lord, you tell me slander and malice and bitterness and lying and filthy speech to take it out of my tongue and cursing. Lord, I don't want those things to be proceeding from my lips, but rather that which is good and profitable to those who are hearing. I want others to be built up when they hear me speak, not think they need to go and excuse themselves 
Because any time they are around me, what I promote in their hearts is the worst side of themselves. I encourage them to think of others badly because they were listening to God. And I call that discernment. Amen? That's a discernment. I have this discerning ability. You, the way you just look like this. You, the way you look like this. And that's the stuff I'm just saying about people. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy who will zoom in, like my friend Bobby Jamison once said, like an eagle that sees and focuses on that one good thing in you. And in my speech, I want to point that out to you, Christian. And say, don't be discouraged. I've seen the Lord's work in you. Do you not see how you're, you've grown in this and grown in that? That's the speech that I want. Lord, I give my tongue to you, my affections. I don't want them to be controlled by every shiny little advertisement that shows up online. So that my constant task is Googling and swiping through stuff because I love it so much. And that's what I give my affections to. Things that are fickle and passing in this particular world are the ones that make me super happy or super sad. But I want to love you with my heart. John Newton has a cool word to say about this. Praise the Lord who has enabled you to fix your supreme affection upon him who alone is the proper and suitable object of it and from whom you cannot meet a denial of fear of change. It says, if, if you love God, thank him for it. He loved you first. He will love you forever. And if he be pleased to arise a smile upon you, you are in no more necessity of begging for happiness to the prettiest creature upon earth than of the light of a candle on midsummer noon. The summer sun, this noontime sun, does not need to ask for help with light from a little candle. And if you have turned your affections to God and you have experienced his love for you, you are totally satisfied. You don't need to go chasing after uh, satisfaction and pleasure out of the little broken systems that this world offers to you. You give him your strength, you give him your passion, you give him your talents. You declare that your life is going to be holy unto the Lord. Me, yours, nothing left, sorry, nothing available. My time is yours, my joys are yours, my talents are yours. Do you know what the gospel does? Here's what the gospel does. The gospel ultimately addresses that mistrust we have when we think doing that is death. That's the lie of the devil. Doing that is boring. And I look to God and I say, no, God, I don't trust myself anymore. That started off in Genesis 3, and it's not really gone well for us as human beings when we choose to make ourselves the ones who can ultimately define what is good and what is evil, yeah, look at the news. Lord, I want my life to be submitted to you. You define for me what is good and that which is evil. You tell me which tree to eat from and which tree not to eat from. And Lord, I want to submit myself to your loving rule and I'm confident that even though my flesh is telling me, Ken, that's boring, boring. That's not going to be good for you. I will trust you. That's sanctification. Sanctification, I will take my members and I will submit them to you. And I will not believe the lie that I can actually live at peace with giving you 20%, 30%, 90% and then hold back 10 or 5 or 2 or 1. That 1% is where I'm not trusting you still. I'm not trusting you. I'm being a little legalist right there. Thinking you're not truly good and you're not worthy to be trusted with my fill in the blank. You wonder what our lives would look like if this is who we were. If we submitted ourselves to God like this. We'd be sanctified. We'd grow. And it all begins with understanding truths we should know. There's only two choices on the shelf. Only two. I am either at any minute of my life submitting myself to sin or to God. Again, I ask you, Christian, whose slave are you? What area of your life have you not trusted God with? What area do you think you can actually allow sin to reign? 
this world to reign or self to reign and for there to be something true, good and valuable that will emerge from there? Or would you allow this text to save you because the stakes are infinitely high? Would you come to God and say, Lord, I'm not trusting you in this area. No wonder I'm not knowing growth in this other area. I'm desperately trying to grow here and really struggling to grow here. But is it because of these other areas that I think are neutral? I have not yielded them over to you? Or if you're, an, if you're not a Christian, would you hear this? If you're a slave to sin, what we call you to is look to Christ. He died on the cross to ransom slaves like you. Because that's exactly what he did for us. He has paid the price to buy you back from your sin so that you would be fully owned and controlled by your good and gracious king. Oh, we plead with you. Do you not already see the effects of sin in your life? Do you not see how they have corrupted you, corroded relationships, your mind, your heart? They have not done good to you. That's sin. It deceived all of us. That's the point of deceitfulness of sin. It appears to be good, but it is not. It does not give that which it advertises. It is chocolate-flavored cyanide. It's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. The pleasures of sin are but for a moment. We plead with you today. Would you turn away from sin? Would you allow the grace of God's word today to cause you to cast off that yoke of iniquity and sin and flee to the arms of Christ and bow the knee? Ask him to rule over you. The reign of sin yields death. The reign of grace yields life. And that's available to you today if you would turn and cry out to Christ for your forgiveness. Believers, I pray that we would take some time to meditate on that which we are not, not because God has not given us the grace, but rather because we have chosen to live lives that are not entirely submitted to him. I wonder to myself what the state of missions would be in this very congregation. If this very congregation as a whole, we saw ourselves as not our own, but singularly belonging to God. I wonder if there's people here today who would hear the gospel because you submitted your time and your friendships to God's purposes and not your own. I wonder if there'll be fruit that will be brought forth on that last day because today you chose to bring that very area of the way you do friendships and the way you do fellowship to the rule of God so that you invite people into that belongingness and you grant to them that life-changing message that if you chose to just keep your life to yourself, perhaps you make it safely home but with a lot of tears and regret at the end of that journey. I, I wonder for us even as believers sometimes, just did a talk on the sanctity of life on Friday and looking at statistics about abortion in this country and seeing that there are over 450,000 babies killed every year in Kenya. A mini genocide happening annually. And you wonder if as believers, we who are so caught up with pursuing worldly purposes that are all about me and my grandness. If my life was submitted to God and to his purposes, if we would not start bleeding and crying about things like that in our society, if some time would be created for us to think and see and grieve and pray and then plan and attempt as believers, to do as much wrecking as we possibly can do. To that evil, somebody rises up on that side and says, you know what, I'm going to organize a group to try and raise awareness of this reality so that there would be more APRO, education, information, adoption centers, new strategies that have not yet been employed, things that we can actually do to do good in our society all around us. But as believers, the world would even fill us because we are gods, holy unto the Lord. The way in which we think and speak and act has been so reinformed by this word 
so that those who live for the things of this world, whose glory is just merely in money and power and status, look at us and see that we truly are slaves of someone else. O oh, church, I pray that it would please the Lord to allow these truths to open up our eyes so that we would truly repent and ask ourselves, whose slave are we? So much life, so much hope, so much strength and freedom lies behind that door. Father, I pray that you'd allow us to, even in our conversations, the rest of this week, in our meditations, in our prayers, Lord, we pray for this grace. We do not want to live shackled by chains that you broke already. We want to live for you. We want to breathe the air of that newness of life that you have offered to us so that our hearts would beat for a greater purpose than the glory of the man in the mirror. We want to live for a transcendent purpose and we thank you that you have called us your own. You have saved us. You have made us your slaves, your servants. You have called us your children. You've made us call laborers. Lord, I pray that there shall not be a saint who belongs to this church, who shall stand before you on that day and look back on their lives and regret that they lived their lives for such fecal, puny, worldly, temporary purposes, but that we would rejoice in the mercy and grace that you bestowed to all of us, that you who saved us by grace, you also allowed us to live lives whereby we presented all that we are and all that we have to you. Would your glory shine all the brighter from us because of this. We pray this through Christ. Amen.